one winter when I was about seven, my friends and I decided that we would uh, build a dam out the back of our school. Now there was this uh, grassy creek that wound through a farm paddock and it, it, um, it narrowed between two banks, which is where we dug up dirt and piled it in the centre. Now it took quite a few lunch times, but eventually we started to flood the paddock and then eventually the neighbour's property next door. And then we took it even further and we built a raft and I have no idea how we managed to build a raft, but we would pile dirt on it and then we would drag it across to stack it up, make the dam higher. And um, the lake would, yeah, we were calling it a lake at this point. When the, when, when the lake froze over, Thomas would jump in and he would, he would um, like wade through breaking the ice with his belly with us sitting on the raft, which is obviously fantastic, right? Uh, you know, unsupervised seven-year-olds you know, in cold, wet clothing in the middle of the winter building a shoddy mud dam. Maybe a little irresponsible. Um, so, does anyone have a fond memory of a wild childhood adventure that they have? Fond? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're like very vivid memories for us. This is a drawing I did around the same age. I was clearly a sort of odd creative kid, but strangely practical. I liked how things were put together and um, was interested in that. And now I make um, artwork in public places. Uh, large, permanent, usually climbable things um, in unsupervised places filled with like children, parents, teenagers, <laughs> where anything could go wrong. And when I'm dreaming up these projects, it's really hard not to get bogged down in all the things you can't do because it's not safe, it's too risky, maybe what if this happens? All these like risk-reducing practical concerns that seem to crush creativity. So, my name's Mike. Um, I'm here today to just share some of um, the experiences that have led me to become the artist that I am today. I'll take you through some of the projects that I've made and um, a lot of the learnings that I've had, often from observing the adventurous child when it comes to things around embracing the inherent risks in life. So, and I hope to leave you with a sense of why it's really important that we encourage like, exploratory and risk-taking behaviour in an everyday public setting. So, my dream was always to be an artist, but I didn't start out that way. Out of school, I studied civil engineering, and uh, my first job was uh, in marine construction, building a pipeline just off the coast of New Zealand. So, the ocean is a wild, dangerous, unpredictable place where you quickly learn to expect the unexpected, there's like no shop around the corner, so you have to be resourceful. And when things go wrong, and often they go horribly wrong, you have to be able to think on your feet to come up with um, solutions. And there's no off-the-shelf solutions, so you have to, you know, you're stuck with your own creativity. Um, which is why engineering is great. It's like, it's logical, it's clear, it's problem-solving, it's like methodical, it's risk-averse. But my other love, art, seems always to be kind of the exact opposite. Hard to combine the two. Which is why every couple of years I would quit my engineering job because something was missing. There was this like constant pull away from uncertainty, trying to escape risk. But it turns out you, you, can't, you can't escape danger. And in February 2011, Christchurch, the city where I lived, was shaken to the ground in a giant earthquake. And the, in the city where I had an art studio at the time, was locked off from the public for almost two years. Overnight, the city became sort of an unrecognisable wasteland, like all of the landmarks that we knew were removed and even precious heritage buildings weren't spared either. So I would sneak back into the inner city and paste up images on buildings. It was my way of temporarily trying to put some love back into the inner city. These projects didn't last for long because as we were building them, the buildings were being knocked down. So, you know, I had to don hivers because you couldn't get access and just jump over the fences and I often used my sort of engineering credentials to talk my way in. <laughs> yeah. Things were changing very quickly, but in hindsight, this like time of like massive and rapid change kind of you know, gave me this also a sense of like strange possibility and kind of started to temporarily open things up. So that period where the stable city that I knew 
it became like the wild ocean. It, it was suddenly dangerous, unpredictable, and you had to like think on your feet. And the sense that everything was really temporary, it never really left me. And so when I was invited to propose a project in the city of Wollongong, I wanted to try and bring this like, sense of like, you know, things are temporary. And I want it to be light, I want it to be vulnerable, I want something that can like, grow alongside the city and the people there, something of like, local significance. Um, and you know, when, I, when I visited the, city, the newly designed city square, this is this fantastic uh, low budget Christmas tree is not mine, I wish it was. <laughs> um, but it was, me, it was missing something, it had no connection to the landscape. So this was my uh, realized proposal, which was effectively like a, you know, a, a living flagpole. And the most prominent part was this um, 100, 100 year old palm tree strapped to the top of a lamppost. It was a part of a series of sculptures that were strewn down the mall. And then there was, you know, these palm tree seats, which are laid on their side, appearing unplanted. Also did these like sandstone boulders with these slightly silly forklift slots cut in them, as if a rock for hire company had uh, dropped them off. Um, and then Troy, this uh, amazing uh, stone guru, um, carved these huge sandstone formations that we went through the onerous process of like eventually getting them down to the mall, which was no small feat. And then, as you do, we thought it'd be great to core a little hole through one of the formations and poke a little palm tree through. <laughs> and we decided to leave it there. And if you go down to Wollongong, it's doing very well four years on. We did a, a rubber matting that matched the granite paving in the mall, and then whacked on a swing. And uh, you have like an elegantly thrown together playground. And this artwork had the kind of unusual requirement that it needed to do something. And it wasn't what the public were expecting. It's, a lot of people said it's not safe, it's too risky, maybe, it, maybe it's fine in nature, but like not in the central city. But the kids, they got it. They instantly understood it and they swarmed it and they helped translate to the adults what the thing was. You know, they, they didn't need to see the hidden engineering that was keeping the palm trees alive, they just, they got it. So I took a big risk on this project, I copped a lot of flack, but in the end I was trying to open up, like, you know, what, what, what's possible, what can we do? Let's do things, let's do something new. And in the end, it, it, it was embraced, which is why it's important to, to be, you know, prepared to take risks. And, you know, if we're observant, we can take cues from the risks that we're drawn to. Because it's like, we want to teach ourselves something. In my, in my work with playgrounds, I am keenly interested in observing how kids want to interact with things. For example, kids like climbing things. They're always annoyingly trying to climb things. If you're trying to walk down the street, they're always scrambling up a tree or like walking along a wall. To them, like everything is potentially a playground and you can't really stop them. So, hold that thought. I was invited to submit a proposal uh, down the road in St. Peter's, where many homes were being taken by the government and demolished to make way for a big highway tunnel project, and Sydney people know what I'm talking about. A very uh, disjointing and very difficult time for that community. So I ended up studying archive images of old homes and proposed to rebuild their front fences in a park from the bricks of the houses that have been demolished. And so here's a, a layout of all the different fences that we built. But I decided to work with a local school to come up with a layout for this. And as you would expect, it ended up being like haphazardly plonked all over the place. A real mashup, which is one of my favorite looks. And here's some photos of us like meticulously working through to try and like faithfully construct these uh, fences. And, you know, we wanted them to be kind of like almost sinking into the ground like a, like a graveyard, but it's quite complicated engineering to sort of arrest them in this position for the next, you know, 50 years or however long. So here's the, the graveyard. But, you know, but for kids, this is like a wild, unkempt ruin, and it's great. And it's, for them, it confirms that they're supposed to explore real risks, because in the end, it's how they learn to keep themselves safe. And, you know, 
kids aren't stupid. They don't necessarily assume things are safe all the time. And it's quite interesting if there's like a loose object or something that looks like it's not connected in. I, I notice that they'll often just like give it a little nudge before they'll try and like yank on it and see if they can walk on something. And you know, they're running all these little risk assessments all the time to see how, how they should navigate the world. And these kinds of spaces like facilitate that for them. And I think we're all kind of intrigued by ruins because there's something that like, we want to know about precarity. We want to know about impermanence for some reason. We want it near us. And you know, we, we somehow, there's something appealing about it. We don't just want straight lines and clean surfaces. So as an engineer, I'm getting pretty great at jumping through hoops. I'm getting great at like, navigating through all the regulations to try and like, open things up, to try and create more, more possibility. And I think it's really important that we do that because when, you know, when people come up to me and they see these projects, they're like, how did you get away with it? Like, who said yes? It's like I've, 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 I've broken some secret rule. And I think it touches on this assumption that we have in the 21st century that everything should be on one track. We should be, it should be more safe. That's the direction we're going. It's the only gospel. We've got to be, we've got to be ordered. We've got to be predictable. It's got to be efficient. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be probably more boring. And so they're genuinely surprised when we kind of get to these projects. But, you know, we know that's not the reality of the world we live in, so, like, why do we try and, like, live as if it's always going to be good? And I think, you know, how do we, in modern cities, ensure that kids uh, can have adventures so they can be prepared in life? And I think, how do we prepare ourselves when we get thrown up on the high seas, you know? We all know the last couple of years what it's been like. It's, it happens and it's going to continue to happen, and, you know, we need to be ready. And so I got this other opportunity in a recent project to propose something much more freeform. Like kids love stacking things and you know, I, I like stacking things too. You sort of find whatever's lying around and put it up into a tower. And so this was like me, I'm the, the seven year old dam builder, piling up towers of rubbish, heavy duty plastic buckets. It was a really a leftovers project. And you know, I even used old trees that they were cutting down in the park at the time and incorporated them. And uh, yeah, I was just trying to like, have a bit of fun with it. And, and then in the end, it's quite complicated engineering to, to pull these off, because I'm trying to design like the, the wild ocean, but sort of want to try and build it like a, like a six, $6 billion dollar like, submarine or something, you know? Like it's, it's, got to, it's got to do both. I think the way the kids interact with this is that they, like, they, they get it and they, just, they move around it because there's nothing prescribed in the way they know, you know how to interact with these things. And what I find really encouraging about these parks is that they're effectively an endorsement from the government that kids need, you know, that risk is valuable and that we see that kids are capable of navigating the big bad world on their own and with their friends when they're older. This is a project I'm doing with City of Melbourne, photo from this week, but I push and I push limits because we need some people to push in the opposite direction of safe thinking. So we don't develop blind spots, and this goes in every area. But I take risk management very seriously, and I'm not just saying that in case my insurer is watching this TED video. <laughs> um, I take it seriously because there's nothing endearing or useful about negligence or recklessness. Risk, risk management 100% helps me deliver these projects. It's very helpful. We, absolutely need to be improving the way we like, look after the vulnerable and the diverse needs of a community. However, what, I'm, what I want to say is, you're also going to think about what we're losing if we potentially you know, blindly focus on reducing risk. We can't put handrails around everything, and even if we could, I don't think it would really benefit us. So I'm going to go back to the start. You know, embracing risk is really just part of embracing life. And thinking about those like, cute little like, seven-year-olds trying to build their little like, lunchtime dam in the middle of winter, like, should we let them do it? Well, it's, it's really up to you guys, but you know, come on. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for, thanks for having me.